I want to welcome everyone back to the Picanino Show. Returning, and it's been what three years, something like that. Yeah, Matt something Erickson. like that. What's going on, man? How's it going? It's good to good to be back. It's good to talk to you, man. Yeah, it's good. Um, well, I mean, it's been a while. Tell everybody a little bit about what you do. Uh, so uh, over at King Pilled on YouTube, it's out, out um, on all the, the podcasting platforms as well. Um, as long as the we don't have file size hiccups. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we, we go live probably two or three times a week on YouTube. We stream on Twitter as well. Uh, and we've been talking a lot more politics lately, kind of politics, economics, philosophy. Um, we are uh, appropriately racist and sexist. And, uh, you know, so we're we're very much in the same milieu as 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 you and a lot of a lot of the rest of us who uh, I guess you'd say exited libertarianism. Uh, we exited stage stage right, in fact, uh, a couple of years ago and kind of gone on a little on a little bit of a journey. I moved out to Texas. I was living in Southern California at the time, moved out to Texas with my family. Um, just just had had a three year old boy who was born uh, during co the COVID year. And uh, so we, we, we GTFO'd from Los Angeles and moved out. We're in the general San Antonio area. Um, I work in real estate, working with a couple of startups and uh, doing the podcast. So if you podcast is called King Pilled, uh, we'd love to have you come listen to us. And you, um, you live near Buck Johnson's. So you guys go to church together and everything. We do. Yep. Uh, yep. We go to the same uh, church. Cool. Cool. All right. The reason I asked you to come on is because, um, I had heard whispers of something that you were talking about. And then I listened and I was like, all right, let's, let's talk about this. Um, <laughs> what, <laughs> I guess what you've termed as the PayPal mafia and, you know, in, in elite theory, you know, we believe that it is, um, especially in the system that we have now, that elites are the only ones that can defeat other elites. So you're looking at what you call the PayPal mafia. Why don't you talk about that? What what is the PayPal mafia? So the PayPal mafia is a it's not it's not a term I coined. Um, it's actually there's a Wikipedia page for PayPal mafia, and it's essentially all of the guys who were involved in in starting PayPal, the founders, initial employees, people who sat on the board. Um, there's a there's probably just looking at the Wikipedia page for it here. There's probably 25 or so of them. And I guess to give a little background to kind of how I stumbled upon this, I. I had sort of checked out from politics a little bit and was more in, focused in the business arena, um, following a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, studying sales, uh, that sort of thing. And we started doing the podcast after we picked up after a little bit of a sabbatical. And, and one of the things that I was talking about with my co-host, Cooper, is uh, we talked about the generations, like this the, the phenomenon from the boomers to Gen X to millennials to Zoomers, and then um, alphas are kind of coming up. And... Mike, I'm I'm basically an early millennial, um, but I was raised by Gen X and by I had really young aunts and, and uncles, so I have always had a lot in common with Gen X, and I kind of see the world a little more Gen X. Uh, Cooper is a Zoomer, and he's very much a Zoomer, and it's been fascinating to me watching the uh, how differently he sees the world. Like we we see the world in terms of like you know elite theory and uh, Orthodox Christians, we like. So we we share a lot of the same common presuppositions, but there's an aesthetic feel to the world that is that that is very different for us, and I can relate to some of it for him, but I definitely notice a, a, a difference. And a big part of that is the sense of kind of nihilism, doom. Uh, this makes sense for the Zoomers that they would feel this way. They've kind of grown up, they came of age in clown world and have lived in clown world the entire time. They've never known stability, peace, prosperity. All the institutions are preposterous. They don't even, they can barely even claim any credibility toward anything. And so this is, you can see this very much in online humor. The Zoomers have a very distinct brand of humor online. It's very, very ironic, lots and lots of layers to it. Um, and they tend to be very different from millennials who, who are generally more uh, kind of naive and a little more, uh, they're very, they tend to be very bought into the system. Like they want to see the system, if they don't, agree with what the system's doing. They want to try to reform it. And they, they very much believe in the ideals of the system. Whereas the Zoomers are more just kind of like, like, fuck it, I don't care, just destroy this, you know, just like burn it, chaos, whatever. 
And then we noticed the kind of a correlation between the boomers and the millennials, that the millennials are kind of like an echo of the boomers. And, and then the Zoomers and Gen X have kind of a similar relationship. We, we, go, we did several episodes on this, we've, so we've gone in a lot of, into a lot of detail on the similarities. But suffice it to say, I realized that the boomer generation is now the youngest boomers born in 1965-ish. They're about seven years away from retirement. This is the youngest boomers. The oldest boomers are long retired. And I began realizing we've been really kind of held under the thumb of this ideology that I've sort of I've termed naive boomer idealism which is kind of the it's basically kind of the ruling ideology of the regime for the last 40 or so years that is very much uh it's it's the constant number go up it's all about our our democracy and globalism and world peace and and we're we're seeing a degeneration of that but it's very clearly degenerating from a certain point and that's this the boomer generation has really outlasted their time at the top relative to other generations because of the economic realities of when they came into power. And they've sort of just stacked up at the top of these systems while everyone else has been backing up behind them. And because they've, I, just as an example of this, like when was the last time you heard of a college, like, a, 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 like a, an Ivy League university president in his 30s or even his 40s? It's been basically since boomers were in their 30s and 40s. They've now, you can see this with the presidents, like the last one, two, three, four, at least four presidents were all boomers. So this is, and this is relatively unusual for the boomer, for, for a generation to hold on to power this long. So I realized as the boomer generation begins to die off, you're going to see an ascendancy into power of Gen X. They're going to become like the new adults in the room. It's going to start with it's not like you it's not like you you um, have a cold hard cutoff and everyone before that thinks one way and everyone after it thinks a different way. There's it, it it blends and it overlaps. But Gen X is much more. Uh, they were raised as the latchkey kids. They it was the era of punk and uh, think John Hughes movies. Like that's like the epitome of Gen X culture. You're st stop talking about me right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and so there's a lot more of a of a sort of a renegade um, uh, spirit to Gen X. They're much more like innovative, let's veer off in some different direction. And so putting these pieces together in my mind, I'm like, okay, we've got an, an empire that's very clearly in its downward phase. It's, there's a lot of things that the system is just barely held together by like duct tape and, and some spit. And we're right. We're clearly at a point of major transition. It's when we're going to transition into something. I don't know what it is, but if I can start trying to think like the people who are going to be the major power brokers over the next 10 to 20 years are going to be coming into those positions, then I might be able to predict where things are going to go and start kind of trying to skate to where the puck's going rather than where it currently is. So this is what led me to start thinking, okay, well, what, what like prototypical Gen X figures are out there and what are they doing what are they saying which direction are they going the people who came to mind for me immediately were tucker carlson elon musk alex jones um joe rogan and uh patrick bet david those were the like the five big guys that really came to mind at first and i realized all these guys have a lot in common they all there's some most of them are some variant of of shit lib but they're definitely not seeing the world or relating to the world in the same way that their predecessors did. So that's what kind of got them onto my radar. This, so it's kind of like we use PayPal mafia as kind of a, an easy um, umbrella term, but hold it loosely. Cause it's not, it's not specifically the guys who are on that list. It's some of the guys who are on that list. Some of the guys who are on that list, I can tell you are very much completely wholesale bought into the regime. You can see it if you go to their Twitter profile and look through their likes or what, if, what they've been tweeting about. You can see very much where they're coming from. Um, but there's a number of names on the list who are, um, they're, they're like venture capital old heads. They've been in the game for a very long time. I mean, they came up with PayPal. And they've gone on to found or be lead investors in virtually like every major technology company that has, that has come to dominate the market over the last 20 years. 
And this is one of the things, if you're looking at elite theory and you're looking at, okay, we're going to have a rise of a new elite class. What's that elite class going to look like? What sort of world do they want to live in? What are their, what are their axes they have to grind? What are their beefs and where are they invested versus the outgoing class? And so you can, with this network of guys, and then kind of the, you start going like one, two, three degrees out from really Peter Thiel is kind of the, the center point. It's kind of like playing a game of like three degrees with Peter Thiel. But these guys here very clearly see the world very differently than the existing regime does. And they're beginning to very loudly counter signal against it. And their biggest issues are China, immigration, and foreign wars, like in the Middle East, Ukraine, um, Israel. They're all either loudly counter signaling these things, or at least they're saying a lot and being suspiciously not... Uh, they're not throwing their lot in clearly on either side, which is saying something for the cultures that they swim in. You kind of read between the lines a little bit with some of the stuff they're saying. Um, so another, another example of guys would be um, the All In podcast has David Sachs, and I think Keith Raboy is on there sometimes, and uh, Chamath Palpataya. But then they have also got Jason Calacanis, who is like very much a, a, a shit. He's like a Mark Cuban type um and then reed hoffman is is very much he's a major nikki haley donor um no well, he's not now but he was um so so when we say paypal mafia it's not strictly these guys and we're also not necessarily saying that there's a a, a coordinated intentional conscious effort meeting in dark rooms smoking cigars planning things out step by step it's more of like a a coalescence of interests and people beginning to align or form into a natural counter elite rather than necessarily like an explicit coordinated conspiracy. So you mentioned Peter Thiel there. And one of the things I noticed about him, I guess, five or six years ago when I started looking into him and people were complaining about Palantir. So uh -huh. how can you trust this guy? How can you... I mean, probably because I have somewhat of a criminal mind, I immediately thought if this guy wanted to take over the world, he would create something that he controls that he could use against his enemies. And that was like immediately, that's what I've always thought of Palantir. I haven't looked at Palantir as something evil, like it's going to be used against me. I've thought mm -hmm. that he could possibly one day use it against everyone in power. Yes. I'm, I, I'm very glad you know what Palantir is because most people don't. And that was... So when I started looking into these guys and, and this... this I, I kind of... I sort of had this hypothesis. I was like, so, okay, obviously Peter Thiel is very much an ideologue on these things. He's, and he's, he's an extremely strategic long-term thinker. And he has a really deep understanding of Rene Girard. He was a direct student of Rene Girard. So he understands mimesis. So, which means he understands how to program people. Mm -hmm. So that's why he became my focus. I'm like, okay, so from him, what people can I start connecting to him? And can I see more people who are talking like him or making moves like him? The obvious one is Elon Musk. And in a similar way with Palantir being... Um, you could almost see Palantir as a move toward the privatization of the intelligence community um, and aspects of the DoD. Uh, in a similar way, I, there was a, there's been two really significant moments recently with Elon. And say what you want about Neuralink. Elon is very clearly not... Anybody who wants to tell me Elon Musk is like some Manchurian candidate or something is... is that, that's, I can get my head around most conspiracy theories. That one's a stretch for me. Um, so Elon, two significant moments recently last year, I want to say it was in the fall, um, NATO slash the U S slash Ukraine. It's like all the same people. They, they reached out to Elon and said they wanted access to some of the Starlink satellites to conduct operations in Ukraine. And he told them to pound sand. And I, I kind of filed that away at the time. I was like, wow, that's quite a move. Like that's. That's a that's a big balls move for a private for a CEO to be able to tell the entire military industrial complex, NATO, UN, like that entire apparatus to just piss off. He's not going to cooperate with them. 
And then and then the big one was when he told Bob Iger to to go fuck himself on live TV. Those these are moves of a guy who uh re, is is recognizing that the regime needs him more than he needs the regime. And then Peter Thiel is making very similar moves. And you can see in the things that they're investing in, in the infrastructure that they're building out, they're laying the groundwork for essentially the creation of a private state. You can see with Palantir, with uh, um, uh, Starlink, with and, and Starlink is, is their, their beta testing on text messaging right now. So we're on mm -hmm. the cusp of Starlink. Phones. F phones. Yes. I mean, I, I yes. said, as soon as I heard that, I was like, I'll take one. Uh -huh. I, mean, I have Star. I have Starlink. I like Starlink. I'll I'll take mm -hmm. a, a, a satellite phone. Basically, what would be a satellite phone? Right. Yeah. So they're 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 big. They're owning the infrastructure. That's what they're doing. They've created, and this is very much a Peter Thiel thing. If you read, if you listen to the way he thinks, you read the way he talks, listen to his interviews. He's very clearly like a. If there's anyone alive right now who I would see as like a true Machiavellian. It would be Peter Thiel. That's the way he operates. I'm not necessarily saying he's my friend, but I definitely have a lot more in common with him, and I'd much rather live in the world he wants to live in than the world of our existing elite class. So, yeah. and, and and that's that's something for you to say, considering you know we don't we're appalled by his personal lifestyle and everything right. like that. Yeah. Right. This is related, kind of, to uh, another person who really started making this idea gained some steam for me and it took me a little bit to catch on to this guy i had a couple i had uh, one guy in particular in my discord say you need to pay attention to this guy he's he's significant compared him to, compared him to obama in terms of his ability to communicate and his political aura and um and i was like nah i i don't see it i was like i this is this is republican andrew yang was what i was calling him and uh and then finally, I don't remember why, but I think it was because I'm, I'm, I'm watching this PayPal mafia thing, which is, you could think of it as sort of like a Silicon Valley um, movement that's happening. And uh, I guess another person connected to this obviously would be Curtis Yarvin. And starting to recognize these things, I was like, I'm seeing the fingerprints of Yarvin. Like whether this is people who are acting explicitly in coordination with him or people who are following his influence directly or people who are just seeing the same things he is and moving in the direction he would move i'm seeing moves that make me think of yarvin and so i've gone back and started listening to him more with this in mind recognizing and i've and i've started to realize he's been laying out the story for us like he's been laying out exactly what's happening he's been telling it to us very clearly and people have been fighting against it but he's not He's not advocating for something to happen. He's describing what's happening. You, if you if you if you listen to what he's saying and you you start understanding some of this background, he's he's describing what's happening. Um, so he went on Charlie Kirk maybe two or three weeks ago, a month ago, somewhere in there. And when I saw that, first of all, I was like, okay, this is who would have thought a year or two ago that Curtis Yarvin would be on Charlie Kirk. I've never listened to Charlie Kirk. I've he's Me he's either. like the the epitome of boomer con like he's the millennial. He's the millennial mirror of that boomer con mentality. He's the millennial boomer con. And I haven't given him any credence whatsoever, but then he had Yarvin on and I'm like, "Okay, I've got to hear this conversation." Like there's I I can't I can't fathom that this meme guy with the really tiny face is like is going to have a conversation and keep up with Yarvin, but he did. And I was like, this is not the Charlie Kirk that I've known before. And he mentions in that interview that he's been studying Machiavelli with none other than Michael Anton. Oh. So we've got Charlie Kirk studying with Michael Anton. This, and so I'm like, okay, something's happening. This is, there, there's something happening here. I don't know what this something is, but I'm starting to kind of get a feel for it. And so the guy I was mentioning a few minutes ago is obviously Vivek Ramaswamy. I saw I didn't pay any attention to him, but then as I was looking at this, I was like, I wonder what his connections are. Like, I wonder how, how long it would take me to dig into him to find Peter Thiel. Because I started listening to some of the stuff he was saying, and I was like, okay, this is, this is the new Blake Masters. This is the sort of the new J.D. Vance, who were obviously were open Thiel guys. 
So I go, okay, let me read, read his Wikipedia page and just get a general background of him. And he's a college friend of J.D. Vance. Peter Thiel has invested in him multiple times, including Strive Asset Management, the firm that he created in 2022. And his first three investors in that firm, and it's, it's the, the, the purpose of the firm is um, it's anti-ESG anti-ESG and anti-DEI. And the idea is essentially to create a BlackRock competitor. The, his first three investors in 2022 were J.D. Vance, Peter Thiel, and Bill Ackman, the billionaire who's just been going guns blazing at Harvard. So now I'm like, okay, there's definitely something happening. And so I started listening to Vivek more closely. And I realized that if you, if you just listen to him in debates or on um, when he's like doing quick sound bites with the media, he does a lot of barnstorming. He's like throwing red meat to the crowd. And then he drops little things in, but he's throwing red meat to the crowd. It's very cringe. It's very boomer con. It's, and that's why I kind of was like, whatever, he's Andrew Yang. Um, but if you listen to his long form interviews, he is the closest thing we've seen to a, a neo-reactionary politician. He's basically reciting, he actually explicitly cites James Burnham in one of the interviews with Andrew Schultz, the comedian. F fantastic conversation. And he has an incredibly deep understanding of how the system works. He's describing in detail the way that the, um, the corruption of power and the way the, the administrative state has distributed power, but nobody's responsible for it. And the way that um, he talks about the horizontal managerial class and the way it functions. I'm like, this dude is a neo-reactionary in like like he's like 95 percent neo-reactionary which then makes me think okay so that other five percent how much of this is saying whatever i need to say to open the doors that i need to have opened in front of me so i i'm looking at him and 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 i'm like obviously so if this guy understands the system the way i do then there's no way he's like the lone billionaire who's just going to go throw himself on the castle ramparts and, and martyr him. Like he, he's obviously not running for president. So what is he running for? What's his goal? Because he's also not just going to be doing a, a, a like get the message out campaign. He's, he used to be a libertarian when he, was in, when he was in college, but he's very clearly moved on from that. Um, and he is, oh, the other thing that stuck out to me about him is that he made a lot of his money in the same way that Martin Shkreli did. And he and Martin Shkreli are actually um, associates. They've worked together on stuff before. And, they, and uh, Shkreli's been very vocally supportive of him. And he said there was some comment of him just like saying that he thought Shkreli was kind of scummy or something like that. But like they're, they're affiliated with each other. Um, so I'm, I'm starting to follow him a lot more closely. And I'm trying to figure out what's his angle. Because it's very clearly... Like, like Trump is going gonna, is, is gonna to get the nomination. There's, like, there's nothing that's going to change that. Mm -hmm. And he ran his campaign very fascinatingly. As I started listening to it, he was, he was being Trump. He was just saying everything that Trump would say. And he was framing, he, he, he managed to thread this needle really well where he's like very, he's competing against Trump, but he's also like super complimentary and supportive of him and is basically like, I'm the backup plan. We got to be realistic here. Trump may get knocked out and I'm the backup plan. Um, so I thought this is, this is actually a pretty brilliant way to be able to sustain a campaign even when the, the, um, the, the result, the outcome is, is, is already obviously uh, predetermined essentially. And he, so when he came into the, the, the Iowa caucus, I'm thinking, okay, like he's getting frozen out of, of all the major media and he's just now starting to pick up a lot of the young influencer people on Twitter, the, the Candace Owens and Tim Pool and these, these people. And which, I mean, if you're trying to raise, a, if you're trying to like get your name up and your, your job is to run a social media campaign, these are very good people to run a social media campaign with. You're going to get a shitload of views. Um, so he, I'm expecting him in, in, in Iowa to get like two or 3%, you know, and that, like, that'd be a great accomplishment going from a zero, completely unknown, get two or 3%. And then I heard he got like almost 8% and I was like, holy shit. Okay. There is something here. And then like 10 minutes later, he dropped out. And I, that's when I, it blew my mind. Cause I was like, so like, what, what's his angle? This had to have been pre-planned. I don't see how he would just decide, oh, I'm just going to drop out now. It doesn't make any sense to me. But then what he did next 
by endorsing Trump and then going to campaign with Trump, that I, I realized, okay, so he's, this is where I'm starting to read between the lines. I'm not, I don't have any confirmation explicitly or otherwise it'd be, it'd be impossible to get this kind of confirmation. But what I'm, what I'm seeing here is it looks to me like Vivek is Trump's handler. Vivek has been put in the position where he has, he has basically cornered Trump, where Trump has no choice except to take him on board, whether as his VP or in some other role. But he's essentially um, implanted himself into the Trump administration by the way he's, he's angled on this. And it's very clear to me that he's not, that this wasn't pre-coordinated because Trump's not happy about having him there. You can watch Trump's body language. It's very clear that Trump doesn't want to share a stage with him because he is genuinely more impressive than Trump when the two of them are together. More energy. He says all the same stuff better. He's more of a bulldog. Trump's starting to seem a little old and tired, but he's very clearly set himself up as the, as the, the successor, at least in the, the eyes of the public. And, um, but there's a couple interesting things he did when he first got there with Trump. First, he goes out on the stage and he does his big barnstorming speech and everything. And that's where Trump, you could tell, like, you know, he's like, why is this guy here? Like, I'd, like, why am I having to put up with this guy? Which is interesting. Like, well, like if you don't want to put up with him, why are you putting up with him? It's, it seems to me like he, he has him there because he's, he's kind of like politically obligated to have him there. And then the next day, Vivek tweets out. I've, I've got his notifications on because I want to see what he's saying. I want to follow, like, track his messaging and see what he's pointing toward. He tweets, just got out of a meeting with President Trump. He promised me that he will never allow a central bank digital currency. And I was like, there's no fucking way that Trump has any idea what a central bank digital currency is or means or, like... And if I'm Trump, I'm the Don here, and this little political upstart whippersnapper comes in and has a meeting with me and I make up like a political pledge to him. And the first thing he does when he leaves the meeting is he goes and tweets it out to everybody. That guy's never getting a meeting with me again. And then two or three hours later, Trump goes out on stage and says, I will never allow a central bank digital currency. And so I was, I mean, I, I, just looking at it, this seems very clearly somebody is now directing trump i don't know if it was if it was before you know, obviously he's been this has been his whole issue all along as he gets surrounded by people that manipulate him and, and push him around but what it's what i'm seeing now is a rising what i can only call a counter elite who are moving in on trump and they're they're uh taking advantage of his compromised position to steer him in a particular direction and that particular direction is counter signaling open immigration, counter signaling uh, NATO, counter signaling Israel, counter signaling Ukraine, all of these major issues. So if you want to tell me that this, this counter elite is controlled opposition and the way this controlled opposition works is they come up and they counter signal all of the key core parts of the, of the regime. Okay, I mean, you, you're going to have to really sell that one to me because that's if that's the case, if that's the level of regime that we're working with, then it might be better for us all to just go get a day job. And and, you know, this is this is this is a these are elites who deserve to be in position because of how profoundly Machiavellian they are. And I don't think they are Machiavellian. I think they're actually really stupid. <laughs> it makes me think of um, you had mentioned him in the beginning, Tucker Carlson but also Colonel McGregor, who have within, especially in the last six months, really gone in on Israel, mm -hmm. and especially McGregor. I mean, McGregor is all but using the J word. I mean, he's saying neocons. He's saying all of these people. I remember he said all of these people are, um, their families come from Ukraine. And you're like, and I'm just sitting there, you know, me knowing that history, I'm like, he's he, he's being smart not to say it. Um, but you also see Tucker doing the same thing. So so you have Tucker who's talking about immigration, uh, talking about digital currency, um, talking about Israel, talking about uh, what was the what was the other one? It was immigration and NATO. And NATO. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
yeah, it seems that there, you know, E. Michael Jones has talked about how there's this, um, you know, he thinks that the, the old wasp elite are sick and tired of Jay power and they're mm. basically gonna, they're rising up now to, um, to overthrow it. And it's interesting because uh, the only person really, I think that you mentioned in that whole group that is, is, is Ackman. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, this, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see which direction if, from what, from what you're everything you're saying, what it sounds like you're saying or what you may be implying is that this mafia has basically thrown everything behind and is counting on Trump to get in there so that they can start this process from the highest office in the land. Yes. And there's so this is where there's a couple other interesting connections that I've stumbled across. Um first one, kind of a quick one. There's an, a fascinating number of guys in this sort of little cabal of, of people who are, well, so you've got David Sachs and Elon Musk and Roloff Botha, who are all from South Africa. Roloff Botha's grandfather was the last foreign minister of the apartheid government. Then um, there's a guy who uh, runs a company called Clearview AI which was a pretty secretive uh, AI, um, uh, like video, uh, what am I thinking of here? It scrapes the internet and looks for, for face matching, yeah, yeah. facial recognition. Yeah. Um, the two first uh, investors in that, or actually three first investors in that, were Naval Ravikant, uh, Peter Thiel, and Chuck Johnson, the, the old uh, like Cernovich alt-right guy. Um, who's also a close associate of Peter Thiel and is the one who introduced Peter Thiel to uh, Matt Gates. Then Peter Thiel is, was the first investor in Facebook and has long been described as a really interesting article. If you search Peter Thiel and Matt Gates, just their names together, an article on WAPO will come up. Very fascinating article written last summer, actually quotes Vivek in there, and this was long before anybody knew who he was. Um, and it talks they talk to several different people who are close to to Peter Thiel and if you have this context you can read behind what they're what they're describing and you can see that they're they're telling you exactly what they're doing that they're creating a parallel economy they're they're creating a parallel um governing apparatus that they can then use to take control of the existing apparatus and it talks in there at length about the relationship between Peter Thiel and Mark Zuckerberg Peter Thiel was his first investor when he was a sophomore in college and has been his mentor ever since. In fact, Zuckerberg has actually put his neck out for him quite a few times with some pretty heated stuff going on with the Facebook board. In particular, Reid Hoffman lost his shit when Peter Thiel openly endorsed and, 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 and donated to Trump. And the Facebook board wanted Peter Thiel thrown out and Zuckerberg stood him down and said, no, we're keeping him there. And if you, I mean... If you've ever hung out with a bunch of wealthy shit libs and they decide they're pissed off about something like that's not a comfortable conversation. Those are not like it's it's this is very tense, high stress sort of stuff. So this isn't just like a token move for a guy like Zuckerberg to, to stick up for a guy like Thiel under these circumstances. Um, so then. One thing that jumped out to me, there's several different thoughts here. So one thing that jumped out to me in reading that was it talked about how Peter Thiel suddenly got really vocally anti-China in around 2019. That's when he ac accused uh, Google of having Chinese spies on the payroll, which is a very anti-Peter Thiel type of thing to do. He's not typically the guy who's going to come out really blustering. He does it every so often, but it seems very targeted when he does it. He's the guy that, you know, Gawker outs him and he doesn't go to war with them directly. He just bankrupts them by bankrolling Hulk Hogan's lawsuit against them. I mean, uh, for a gay guy, that's a pretty alpha move. So, <laughs> so he's probably a he sociopath. Comes, I've, yeah, I mean, he seems very much like it. Yeah, yeah. Most people in that position are. Yeah, he's. I mean, extremely autistic sociopath. You know, tomato, tomato. Um. So he, 
he he's he he comes out and he's like really like like barnstorming against China, which is kind of an interesting move. It makes it stand out to me a little bit. But this what this article pointed out was that Zuckerberg, that was the point where Zuckerberg turned on a dime, and all of a sudden he was testifying in Congress about how much of a threat China is. And this was after he was he was slobbing China's knob for a long time. All of a sudden he turned on a dime with Peter Thiel and began really going after after uh, China. So that, that to me, that indicates a, a, a close relationship with them. So the thought popped into my head. I realized, it, actually, it was, it was uh, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Jason, from the 2-Bit Podcast, who's been helping me put, put a lot of these pieces together. Um, and he said, who was it at the end of 2020 who was telling us that the best possible outcome would be for Biden to be elected? because it would take down the temperature in the room. Everybody would get to see what Yarvin. the government actually looks like. It was Yarvin. So a, an associate of Peter Thiel is saying, it would be best if, if Biden gets elected. And then the guy who sees Peter Thiel as a mentor spends $400 million fortifying an election, preserving the election integrity. I, th I can't prove anything, but... It seems very interesting that now that puts us four years later where there is no energy in the Democrat Party at all. It's exactly what Yarvin predicted. It has completely sucked the energy out of them. You're getting people like Jamie Dimon coming out and saying Trump was right on immigration, the economy, and NATO. He went to Davos. Jamie Dimon, the, the um, uh, CEO of JP Morgan, went to Davos and said the words, Trump was right. And then he attached those to NATO, the economy, and immigration. That's I mean, you're talking about the the wasps, the old wasp class turning on the other class. Maybe that's a blip in that direction. But and now what you also get is Trump is compromised. Having him be under indictment is very useful to a potential counter elite that wants to take advantage of him and use him as a vehicle. Because he needs all the friends that he can get. You need him to cross the Rubicon. And you need him to have a motivation to cross the Rubicon and to keep crossing the Rubicon. And if the alternative is jail, that's a, that's a pretty, good, pretty good bet. So there's those connections there. And then the thing that I think really kind of sealed this for me was a couple of years ago um, when I was with uh, Stapleton on Wealth, Power, and Influence, I had a, a listener reach out to me. We were talking about Prospera, the um, uh, the like free private city in uh, Roatan, Honduras. And a guy reached out to me. We talked about it on the show, and he reached out to me and he said, "Hey, I'm I'm friends with a couple of significant people within Prospera. I'd, I'd put you guys in touch for an interview." And it ended up not working out. We couldn't get connected, and and uh, then it kind of fell off our radar, and. He happened to come back on my radar again recently, and I was like, hmm, I wonder if there are connections with, with uh, Peter Thiel to Prospera. So I went and started looking into it, and it took me, I don't know, 30 minutes of research maybe, and I found three tight, like one degree removed connections between Prospera and Peter Thiel. And then I talked to my contact connected to it, and he said, yeah, like this, it's like open secret. He's very, it's not even a secret. Like he's, he's got a number of different companies, um, investment firms, Charter Cities Institute. He's got a whole bunch of different, uh, there's another one called, I think it's um, Pro, Prosoponos Capital or something like that. These are several different capital organizations that are involved in creating free private cities throughout the world. Um, big overlap with Bitcoin and all of that. And so then it's, it's not as easy to find a direct connection between Thiel and Bukele, but I, I mean, at this point, it, I mean, Thiel has been deep in the Bitcoin world for a very long time, long enough that he could be multiple layers removed and have some plausible deniability and everything. But obviously Bukele has some very powerful backing for him to be able to get away with some of the stuff he's doing and saying, he clearly has someone who's keeping the intelligence communities off his back. And so you've got the guy who is the master of mimetic theory. He understands the power of modeling. 
you create a model that you want people to follow. So now we have, if you go read Patchwork, within the first couple of paragraphs, there's a sentence that says something like the first patch will probably be a low rent, third rate knockoff in some poor third world country. But even if it is, it'll still be successful. So now we see Bukele popping up. And, and so Jason, the two-bit podcast, one thing he said that um, he wouldn't be surprised to see, and now we're starting to see it, is what he called a build a Caesar, kind of like build a, bear, build a bear, where you can get these different right-wing figures that can pop up in a, in a given country. And each of those guys doesn't individually need to be Caesar. But they can be Caesar on one thing. So for Malay, maybe he's Caesar on, 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 uh, on uh, drastically cutting down the, um, the size of the, their administrative state, their executive branch, firing government employees. For Bukele, he's, I mean, he's probably the closest thing we've seen to a Caesar in a very long time. And then you've got, you've got uh, uh, Geert Valders in um, The Dutch Guy. Who, I mean, he'd be a, a like a communist basically in the U.S. But you know, if he if he does something with agriculture, like you, all you need is these guys to do one specific thing, and that becomes a model that can be reflected back. Vivek even referenced this obliquely. He said um, when he was on Tim Pool, he said, "If I'm if I don't make Javier Malay look like a moderate, I'm not doing my job. I'm not getting caught up in the specific politics of it. Is that that's the modeling right there." Now that that example exists and is successful, then you can say, hey, see what they have? Let's have that here. So all of these things are all beginning to network and work together. But the big thing that I think puts it all together is Project 2025. Have you heard of Project 2025 at all? This is fantastic. Yeah. This is great. I think this is actually a good thing. I'm torn about talking about it publicly because it's almost like it works better if it's not super public. And it's very weird that it's not super public. Because Project 2025 is something like 85 different GOP think tanks. It's led by Heritage and TPUSA, but it's got all the other different three-letter, four-letter GOP acronyms involved in it. There's 80-something of them. And what they're doing is creating a presidential transition team whose goal is to, they're using the, Heritage has had their, their um, mandate for, for leadership that they've, they gave it to, to Reagan and he instituted like 73% of their recommendations or something. And then Trump instituted 60% of their recommendations. It's basically a, it's like a thousand page playbook for conservative, uh, uh, how, how a conservative should govern as the president. The idea is that you give it to the president and he doesn't have to go commission all these studies and everything. Everything's already done and laid out for him. Um, but something that they've added this year is, number one, a presidential academy where they're taking applications from people to learn how to govern. So they'll prepare you with essentially like a university course that will set you up to be brought right into the bureaucracy and to be able to govern as a right winger, as a conservative. It's very BoomerCon. There's a lot of BoomerCon overtones with it, and it's a lot of BoomerCon people involved with it. But this is... They're actually creating a, a political operation to take power and hold power and, and basically fight dirty. So my hopes aren't high that they're going to accomplish everything that they want. But one of the key things that they want to do is slash the federal workforce by 50 to 75 percent. And when I heard that, I said, well, there's somebody else who's been talking about this exact same thing. It was Vivek. So I went and started listening to, if you listen to Vivek's interview on the Sean Ryan show, it's like a three hour interview. And he goes into extreme detail about exactly how you would need to, to do this, to be able to navigate the bureaucracy, how you would actually have to comp, uh, accomplish this, what specific statutes would allow you to do this. And so you don't have to get bogged down in legal fights. You actually can have a legal precedent to do all of these things. Um, and his, like, what he's talking about is slashing 80% of, of the federal workforce. Abolishing the FBI, the uh, DHS, CDC, FDA, um, DEA, I think. A whole bunch of different um, Department of Education. He, he's, he's talking about slashing all of those. And these things line up very closely with Project 2025. And he mentioned in this Sean Ryan show interview 
that he is working with a team of people from the venture capital world and from the organizational management world and psychology, and they're putting together screenings essentially for uh, people who, are, who would go in and, and go to war with the administrative state. This is the language that both he and Project 2025 have used. So put that together then with, this is a, a thing being, being spearheaded by the Heritage Foundation in cooperation with TPUSA and then a whole bunch of other organizations. And then you have Charlie Kirk from TPUSA working with Michael Anton from Hillsdale studying Machiavelli. The, this is very clearly a, a something. I don't know what it is, but it's very clear to me that it's a something. And it looks to me like the goal here is to force Trump to take on a VP from this counter elite. This like Silicon Valley, Claremont, Hillsdale, Heritage overlap. I think that the proposition that they've made to him is you take our VP, he's going to run your administration for you. You're going to be the chairman of the board. Your job is interfacing with the public, giving speeches, um, barnstorming, accepting all the glory, taking all the credit for everything, going to photo ops with heads of state, traveling around, golfing. You do your thing because we know that's what you want to do. And we're going to run your administration. We're going to institute your vision for you. And so the VP in this case, this is my hypothesis. I, don't, I can't prove this. This is me just connecting dots. My hypothesis is that the VP choice is going to tell us a lot about which direction this goes. Because if you get Lee Zeldin, that's very obviously the Zionist neocon establishment regime cabal has put their leash on him. That's, that's how you know something, okay, it's gonna, we're going a different direction. I don't know what it is. But if you got Vivek or J.D. Vance or Matt Gates or someone like that, then that would be a very strong signal. The Dark Horse candidate, who I would absolutely, it's not going to happen. I just, I just like to say it to get people worked up. But the guy that would really signal game on would be Eric Prince, who has also come back onto the scene now and is starting to do interviews. And he is very, very concerned about the state of things. And I didn't realize, I thought Eric Prince was kind of a, uh, like a meathead sort of, you know, he's just like a, you know, like, like Jocko Willing oh, no. sort of the way that I saw him. No, I've, no, I've, I've heard him speak before. No, no, he is, he is a true statesman. Yeah. He's a, he's a devout Roman Catholic convert with 12 children. You know, you know, it's hilarious. I was when, right before you said that, which is, which is awesome. I was thinking he reminds me of somebody who would be he, like, in Rome. Cincinnatus. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know that he'd give up power after he <laughs> after he cleaned everything up. But, yeah, I don't um, know if he would either, but he strikes yeah. me as being of being that type of uh um like sacrificing himself for his people. Like he sees it as his he's he's bound to his duty. Yeah, he's 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 not of this time. No. Yeah, he he's not a modern man at all. There's mm -hmm. something very odd about him, and I think that odd thing is is that he's he's like a man out of time. Mm hmm. And yeah. he's he's very as I've been as I've been digging into all of this and starting to kind of piece together what I think is happening. There's I've gotten a lot of pushback from people who, frankly, I, I understand the the apprehension. I understand the cynicism. I understand. The majority of these guys are shit libs. Like they're they're they want to have a better liberal society. But I don't need them to be my ideal red Caesar. Like I don't need them to. Be, in fact, Caesar isn't red. Caesar is purple. The you 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 if, if if he's a red Caesar, he's not Caesar. He has to. He ultimately is going to have to govern as above it all. So. I, but I don't need them to be my best friend. I don't need them to share my beliefs. I just need them to advocate for my interests and or even less than that, create a world that I can live in that isn't explicitly hostile to me. I will take being um, not perfectly aligned with me 
as long as they're not openly hostile to me and want to destroy me and everything I hold dear. I think there's yeah. a there's a phenomenon. A, a lot of the guys, a lot of the people who kind of came through the 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 libertarian to NRX, libertarian to alt right. There, I mean, there very much was a pipeline, very clearly. And the people who came through that pipeline, um, I think a lot of us have held on to our libertarianism still, where you get the you know he's not racist enough, he's not sexist. Oh, like with with Vivek, he's uh, he's a pajit. If you if you haven't sat down and listened, if if you if you were to sit down and listen to him and your takeaway is always a Pajit, then I just can't take you seriously. But when I hear that, when I hear the people that respond that way, like I, I I'm sympathetic. I understand your your cynicism. I understand where you're coming from. But what I hear is he's not libertarian enough. He's not a real libertarian. If you're dealing with a counter elite, your counter elite is not going to represent your interests directly because the entire idea here is that the elite is explicitly hostile to your interests. So they're not going to ever allow for the rise of an elite from your camp. It's going to have to be something that's detached from you. That's why they can be elites. That's why they can be a counter elite. So we, it'd be great to have our elite be the new elite. But in order for that to ever happen, at the very least, we're going to have to have a different elite. Maybe we can have this counter elite and then we can you know, make our moves, we're still decades away from being able to, to throw our weight around like that. So what are we going to do in the meantime? Just sit here and say that all the people are not a libertarian enough? Or can we identify where they're moving and align our interests with them? That's, and that's basically what I've been, um, I've been focusing on. And I've, I've gotten a lot of pushback from people who are, oh, they're just never going to, you know, here's the picture of him kissing the wall or, yeah, like that's, Caesar was not a counter elite until he was. I've been saying this for a long time that I, I said this about DeSantis. I said this about Elon. I said this about Tucker. Like if you look at Tucker's background and you say, oh, well, he came from the CIA, so he's obviously compromised. Well, if you were trying to build a profile for a Caesar type, he's necessarily going to be someone from within the regime who has all the regime ant smell. Like, that's how he's going to get into that position in the first place. He's going to have to attain a level of significant power, which if he's going to attain a level of significant power, he's going to have to kiss some walls because that's the way the system works right now. But it's pretty easy to kiss a wall and not care about it if you have bigger designs. Yeah, I think a lot of the pushback by people I know against Vivek is just the fact that they look at Great Britain and Europe and they look how, mm -hmm. you know, people of people who look like Vivek have been pushed into positions of power there. And, um, you know, they're like, you know, w we had that for eight years and, and you know, we tried the anti-racism thing for eight years and those eight years turned out to basically turn the country into even, an even bigger pile of shit than, than it was, than it was headed into becoming. Um, I think that's what, um, I don't think it's what he's saying. I think it's just there. It, a lot of people are looking and they're like, well, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's like, well, <laughs> do we need another black guy? Do we need another brown guy in there? Is that, is, is that what we're being sold? You know, that, that's, I think that's what people, that's what a lot of people who don't like Vivek, uh, who don't want Vivek is. It's like, maybe they, they don't have a problem with a lot of the things he's saying. It's just like, they feel like they're being sold somebody who doesn't look like you know somebody who doesn't look like a heritage american and then you have him and nikki haley going at it on stage and you're like okay well there's two of them <laughs> right <Yeah>. bastard bloody <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty yeah. funny but yeah yeah I, I i uh the fascinating thing with him is he was born and raised in cincinnati like he's a he's a midwest kid which is which is funny he's he's almost Apart from being not white, he, he's, he's about as white as he possibly could be in every other sense of the word. Now, that, that difference is significant. That's, you can't just, just write that off. But would I prefer to see Blake Masters there? Yeah, for sure. But I don't think Blake Masters would ever get there. I think, I think part, of, part of the deal with the devil here is that if we're going to start having an elite class that speaks our language that at least gives at least deference to alone. our views it doesn't hate yeah, or at least leaves us alone right then 
there's a good chance that the first ones who are going to be able to get away with it are going to be the ones who look like the regime pets. They're going to be the regime pets who, who turn like turn on them. And could, does that mean they could then turn on us? Sure. But I mean, like this is where it gets to the, like, not a real libertarian. Okay. So what's your alternative? This is what's real. This is what exists. We have a guy who is, um, by a lot of indications, seems like he has the presidential administration by the balls. And he essentially sounds like a guy who spent the last five years listening to Oren McIntyre. I, I don't like, at the very least to me, I don't care about Vivek. I care about what Vivek represents, what he stands for, what, what, what he indicates is happening. What it shows is that our circle of the internet is more influential than we realized. Because either, either he's been influenced by the same influences that have influenced us, or he sees us as significant and, and a threat or, or um, uh, influential enough that we're worth pandering to. Like the fact that, that our interests are worth pandering to should be a white pill. Because why else would someone pander to us? You know, a, a, a bunch of, of autists on the internet who talk about elite theory and, and whatever, recovering libertarians. Why would anybody care about our interests? Why would anybody, anybody care about um, uh, speaking a language that we're going to hear and that we're going to recognize and understand? That indicates that we have some sort of power or influence that can be used. So at the very least, if this guy wants to pander to me, then... He needs, he must need something from me. So I'm going to make sure that I begin crafting that relationship the way I want it to be. I mean, it used to be that when you wanted somebody on board with you and you guys were maybe at war, you were at war with someone else and somebody else came in and you were like, Hey, I want you to work with me. You'd say, Hey, I'm going to give you money and you're on my team now. And it'd say, okay. And it's very clean and elegant and you don't have to like care about what's actually inside someone's head. It's like, I want this. Yeah, I want that too. Okay, I'll give you money and we'll go get it. Okay, sounds good. Let's go do it. The, and, and this is, I mean, this is formalizing politics. So I'm very happy to um, develop a patronage relationship with this rising counter elite. And if they don't represent my interests fully, if they're willing to kiss the wall and do all this stuff that, that is revolting to me, then whatever. It's better than what I've had before. So I'm going to accept that for now and then and then look for the next thing that's better. Because if they're doing that now, that indicates that something more is going to come down the line. Yeah, it, I think a lot of people like push back because then it seems like incrementalism. But it doesn't sound like what what you're describing is incrementalism. It sounds like it's uh, shock and awe, basically. Mm -hmm. Shock and awe to the system. Because if you're yeah. going to go to eliminate, um, you know, that many, you know, the one thing I would, the, the one thing I guess I would worry the most about is the fact that the military has become so cucked mm -hmm. and there, a lot of that military is shit lib and with the regime, you know, I'd be worried about, you know, what that would look like. You know, what's funny is, um, uh, I've started running ads on my, um, you know, like inserted ads on my show and people have told me there's like border patrol ads and I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, well, yeah, you don't really want to work for the border patrol under this administration, but imagine if a bunch of our guys became border patrol. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's like, it, it's like I always say about localism. It's like, you know, if you if you're a libertarian, get a get a, and you want a lib, you want a libertarian town, and you want you want some control, get elected sheriff or get elected mayor, and you have that kind of power. Um, but shout yeah, out to people Andrew. just don't. It, the problem is the biggest problem is in in recognizing things like this and. You know, I know you're not trying to sell it. You don't care if people believe you or not, because that's the same way I am. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when you're everybody nowadays is just black pilled. Well, and, and I'm not saying they're completely black pilled in like their personal life, but when it comes to politics, it's like nothing ever gets better. Nothing ever improves. And 
it's hard for me as somebody who makes sure that there's a ton of history on my channel that you've seen, we've given you examples of it improving before. Mm -hmm. Russia right now is a hundred times better than it was in the 90s. I mean, Russia in the 90s was a third, was not even a third world country. They were, it was serfdom. Mm -hmm. And they're better now. Why are they better? Yeah. And look at also, yeah, look at El Salvador. Nothing ever gets better. Well, nothing here has gotten better, but you can look at other places. You can see where it's gotten better. And that's why I talk about Bukele all the time. And, um, you know, I've done episodes on Putin and talking about, you know, and yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not deluded to think that Putin is my guy. He's on my team, you know, or he'd, you know, he'd want to take a meeting with me or something like that. But when I look at someone like him or Bashar al-Assad, I see somebody who seems to like and want to treat their own people better than what what is in this country. And mm-hmm. for you to be blackpilled and I think that anything things can't change, um, you're ignoring you, you're ignoring a lot. You know, and you can mm-hmm. say, well, you know, all the the military industrial complex here, everything, yada, yada. It'd be so much harder, everything like that. But really, I mean, yeah, I remember after the 2020 election, or it was like right before the 2020 election, um, oh, it was right after, Yarvin wrote an article talking about how it came out. I think it came out on the on the day that they actually announced that um, – that Biden, they were giving it to Biden, how Trump could take power over mm-hmm. the government and could constitutionally basically make himself dictator. And that's what that's the case he made on Charlie Kirk show. Yeah. So um, is it is it likely? I mean, it'd be painful. It'd be painful for some people, but um I'm not one to give up hope. I would rather have a, um, you know, know, somebody like Peter Thiel, who, like I said, we both look at, we both look at his personal life and we absolutely, you know, think that we absolutely have to believe that that influences everything else in uh, that he does. But um, would it be, would it be preferable to what, is now i mean we're in a we're in a fucking train i mean the train's barreling down the tracks and the, 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 it's coming up to track that doesn't exist is mm-hmm. what, well what do you do i mean don't put your hope in it but also you know i guess take the information that you've given now and maybe it can um help people to open their eyes and see what's going on and i think really probably the next thing um, there, there could be little things that people could notice, but Trump's VP pick is probably what's going to be like the next thing that would tell you if there's anything to this at all. And that one, I, I genuinely, there's, there's certain names that would be just instant black pill. Like, okay, yeah, oh, that's, yeah. it's, it's off. Um, any woman, uh, just, I mean, even like Carrie Lake would be like, okay. Yeah, I see, but yeah. any other woman is just yeah, just immediate. It's not a woman's job. Well, it's Carrie Lake been. and definitely yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, they're, what they're also thinking about, and I'm sure you've thought about this, is the fact that Trump's old. Mm-hmm. There's a chance over that four years, and then who's going to be VP? Mm-hmm. Whoever whoever the VP is now is likely going to be the Republican nominee for president in 2028 mm-hmm. and maybe beyond. Yeah. And so it's not going to be DeSantis. No, 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 no. That's the oh man. He he made Howard he, Dean look like look he, like a he, successful political campaign. I mean, he shit the bed so bad. Yeah. It's just uh, stay in stay in Florida. You know, do mm-hmm. your you know, pa- pass your anti-semitism laws in florida god i'm so i almost moved to florida last year i'm so glad i stayed in alabama yeah (laughs) yeah no kidding 
the it's it's pretty clear like you can see like ever since he he um stepped down it's like he's done a 180 and i'm pretty confident that he it seemed like this was the case and it seems even more obvious now that he never wanted to run that he basically got leveraged or forced into running and he was not happy he was not comfortable with it just did not want to be there and he seems completely re-energized now i think the one name at vp that would leave me i would genuinely not know what to think about it would be ben carson because my perception of him is that he's just a complete squish just like seems like he's gonna fall asleep talking I've known about him his like my entire life because I grew up Seventh Day Adventist and he's Seventh Day Adventist, so he's like the Seventh Day Adventist celebrity. And mm. so he, he you know, he's he's a good guy, you know, but that he's one of the ones that's rumored that I mean, like Tim Scott is an obvious just empty suit, just a just a goofball. Um but someone like Vivek would be like you know it's game on then. Like one thing Vivek mentioned in the Sean Ryan show was that the two most important positions to get staffed with people who are on board is um omb and opm omb being the uh office of management and budget which is basically the the cfo of the executive branch and opm is the office of person office of personnel management which is hr hr basically yeah. and if you don't have your loyalists there then everything else can go off the rails but the thing with this rising silicon valley tide is like the one thing that all of these guys get is how executive power works. They've started companies, run companies, invested in companies, spent their entire life in startup culture. They're, they've made billions of dollars by identifying how to run an efficient, like a maximally efficient, effective organization. They understand how to market, how to speak to people. They understand technology on a really deep level. They necessarily have to have great understandings of capital markets and global economies. And so they, th this is the making of a genuine, and, and they don't, they're not invested in the existing economic structure of things. Like one of the reasons they're um, not pro-immigration and actually a lot of them are very anti-immigration is because, well, there are a lot of them are, are like H1B. They're, they're, they're very pro-legal immigration, but it's like, I mean, I'll take what I can get. Someone who wants to stop the like 20 million people a year coming across, let's start with that. I'm fine. Someone who wants to do that, that's that's very much an urgent problem. Let's get that taken care of. And they are all very vocally signaling this. Look at I'll give you some, give some names for people who want to go just dig into this themselves. Um uh Luke Nozek, David Sachs, Elon Musk obviously, Peter Thiel, um Roloff Botha, Ken Howery, Keith Raboy, um, and then there would be uh, Mark Andreessen would be another um, connected one, and then which then gets you connected to Tim Ferriss, Naval Ravikant. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, David Raboy has been has run Founders Fund, Peter Thiel's main investment firm, for a long time, and we were talking about this in the Kingpill Discord a few weeks ago. And we were kind of triangulating this and we're like, if these guys are genuinely making a move for cornering the market on infrastructure, the one thing, the one crucial thing they don't have is microchips. They don't have any like a controlling interest in any major microchip company that we can figure out. And like a two weeks after we talked about this, our, our theory was this is, this is the purpose of Tesla. Like this is like Tesla is not for robotics and, and electric cars. Tesla is for basically um, building out the infrastructure to be able to start um, their own uh, semiconductors. And like a week ago, maybe less, Keith Raboy left uh, Founders Fund. Keith Raboy? And, yeah. Okay. Keith Raboy, R-A-B-O-I-S. <clears throat> um, he left Founders Fund and joined uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he joined a different investment firm that is uh, run by the guy who's the co-founder of Sun Microsystems. So I don't know if that's, we were just talking about them getting into the semiconductor business, and that's a very interesting move. But so you have all these different guys that are um, 
involved in the creation of these of these major fundamental infrastructure companies extremely wealthy all cross invested with one another and they understand executive power and this is what yarvin is signaling we have a crisis of executive power we don't have a, a the way they see the administration which increasingly is how i'm seeing the administration as well is that these are not um machiavellian uh masters of statecraft the biden administration is run by fucking retards they're these are incompetent people these are not brilliant savvy operators they're genuinely incompetent shallow insulated people you can see this in the way they manage the whole thing with texas it was just a, a monkey fucking a football all the way along through it and to read back like Machiavellian crafting and scheming onto them is projecting power onto them that they don't deserve. They, their power is waning. They're losing influence. They're losing control of institutions. And we're seeing death throes in this. But th this is not a, a group of powerful people. It's a group of desperate people, which can be even more dangerous. But that means that if there is a legitimate crisis of any sort, this is how every major crisis ever happens. It, when you have a weak, fragile regime, it reveals the weakness and fragility of the regime and creates the pretext for the rise of the new regime. This current regime is definitely not going to last forever. Mm -hmm. It's very clearly on the downswing. And even just simply because the most powerful people operating it right now are going to be dead in 20 years. Whereas this, this new kind of rising counter elite are not going to be. They're just entering their prime. They understand how executive power works and they're influenced by, whether directly or indirectly, they're influenced by people who think like neo-reactionaries. So I yeah. see that as, as a cause for optimism. Yeah, it's what you're talking about is you're talking about people who would see, who would appear to um, manage a po polity very much like a business. And um, where do we start reading about that in 2007? Mm-hmm, right. Yeah, it's it's sure. and I'll take that. I'll take a, a a polity that's managed like a business, you know, Singapore. You know, there's there's yeah. plenty of examples of this sort of thing. And it's clearly yeah, something that. that's on the rise. I've said that I would live. I'd live in Singapore in a second. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah no question. Or L Liechtenstein is the same way. Mm -hmm. He's the the king there. Well, he stepped down. His son's running it now. Um, it's basically a corporation. Mm hmm. And the reason why it's one of the safest places to live on the planet is because it's in his best interest for it to be safe so that his business can thrive. And he's, and and he's someone who's been influential on Peter Thiel as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I ultimately, am. like you were saying something about uh, not uh, um, uh, like some about like being black pilled and, and, and uh, like the hope and optimism thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if things are going to get better. I mean, eventually, some at some point along the timeline, things are going to get better. Like Stapleton used to say, never bet on the end of the world because mm -hmm. when it does happen, you're going to have bigger problems. <laughs> so I'm not going to bet on it being the end of the world. It's the end of a, of, a, of a regime cycle. I don't know if that end is going to take 10 years or 100 years, but I think it's probably closer to 10 than it is to 100. And I don't think that that transition period, because the other thing, like a regime doesn't, like collapse and then a new regime rise the new regime rises as the old one is like do my hands here as the right, old yeah. one is is going down the new one's coming up they yeah. overlap that's why there's a time of crisis and strife are we at the end of this time of crisis and strife or are we just or is it just beginning in either case the one thing that is sure to ensure that nothing good does happen is if everybody believes that nothing good is going to happen. Human belief is incredibly powerful because your belief dictates your attention. And your attention is what you, what you focus your attention on is what you worship. So the, the human capacity for worship literally changes the structure of reality. The, thing that, the things that humans worship, the things they focus their attention on, are the things that come to pass. So if you focus your attention on doomerism and blackpilling and deselling and, and um, cynicism and nihilism, that's what's going to come to pass. But in order for something good to happen, there's going to have to be within some 
segment of the population. There's going to have to be a revival in the spirit of masculinity and um, the, the spirit that conquered the frontier, the desire to explore, the belief in something more, that something's out there. We have to go find that. We have to create it. We have to produce it. This is a fundamental thing about the spirit of a man. And, is, and we've lost the spirit of masculinity. And we're seeing that then in this rise of nihilism and meaninglessness. Because men are the ones, men are the productive ones. Men are the creative ones. The man is, the woman receives into her, the man puts it into her. You can think of this in, in, in human sexual terms, and you can think of it in terms of like planting things. You have Mother Earth and you plant down into Mother Earth. This is the masculine spirit that man was created to exercise dominion over the earth. And his first task he got was to name the animals, which is to create, which is, which is creating identity, which is what creates structure and order. This is the ma masculine responsibility. Doom pilling and black pilling and, and ascribing all manners of unconquerable power to your enemies is like the least masculine thing imaginable. So even if all is is doomed and hopeless there's you lose nothing by projecting hope and optimism out into reality around you eventually it's going to become self-fulfilling this is just the way that that human societies always function so this is and this is part of the magic of trump was he revived that spirit of lightheartedness and optimism and energy that big injection of energy was was transformative to the nation so now as we've come eight years later, even Trump doesn't have the same effect he did anymore. People are cynical of him, right, rightly so. Someone like Vivek comes along, people are cynical of him. Someone like Peter Thiel comes along, people are cynical of him. And I would say, it, this is damning with faint praise, but the fact is he's a gay guy who's married who didn't want anybody to know about it. That's... That's a that's a an improvement on the gay guy who's married and he wants everyone to know about it. This is I don't know how many of our of our uh, ancient heroes that we've we look back and we think about and talk were probably actually gay and we just never learned about it because once upon a time you just kept it to yourself. So e each of these guys comes along and they're and people are cynical of them, but there has to be a point in order for things to turn around. There's going to have to be a point at which someone decides there is something worth fighting for. There is cause for hope and optimism. We do have something we can do. We can all start gathering and focusing our efforts on one common goal. It doesn't have to be the ultimate common goal. It just has to be a better one than where we are right now. I don't know which segment of the internet, which segment of society that's going to happen with, but I know it's going to happen somewhere. So I guess it might as well happen with my circle. That's, I guess, the way I, that I look at it. Let's end it right there and uh, leave it open for the future. Um, remind people where they can find your stuff. Kingpilled on YouTube, Real Kingpilled on Twitter, Instagram. I think I post videos on TikTok occasionally, but I don't really do anything with it. Um, and on all the podcatchers, you should be able to get Kingpilled. If there's technical diff difficulties, I'm sorry. I hired a monkey to 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 manage my podcast for me and i haven't trained him well enough yet <laughs> <laughs> all right matt thank you it was good to thank catch you up. man i appreciate it likewise